hello everyone and thank you very much for the opportunity um, to be here today. I am Tracy Berry from KGW Television and it is my privilege to moderate this debate for Portland Mayor between Charlie Hales and Jefferson Smith. I'm sure many of you tuned in to the presidential debate earlier this week and of course I did too. I actually watched part of the debate with Cokie Roberts. That really is it. I just told you that, so you would be really impressed. <laughs> She's brilliant, by the way, and really funny, but it was great. Um, the debate will have several sections. First, each debater will give a three-minute opening statement in the order previously determined very high-tech names out of hats. Jefferson Smith will open today's debate, and following the opening statements, debaters will respond to questions. They have been written in advance uh, by the City Club's Friday Forum Committee and the City Club staff. The questions were not shared with the debaters. See my script? It says confidential. I had to hold this overnight. Do you know how hard that is for a news person? It was a long night. These questions uh, are the only questions that will be asked today. There will be no questions from the floor. Sorry about that. We will rely on the judgment of our distinguished panel of City Club members seated right here in the front to decide whether or not the debaters have indeed answered each question. Do you love that? They're the truth squad. I would have demanded like a little superhero cape or something, but I think this is a great idea. Um, what happens is that uh, if they don't think <clears throat> that the person has answered the question, they have little cards. Hold up your cards, you guys, right. And if two, <laughs> do you love this? If two of them hand up a card, I will then ask the candidate to give it another shot, right? They'll have 30 seconds to give it a second try. And if the debater still fails to answer the question, the panel can hold up their cards again. They're so well trained, my goodness. But the debaters will not get a third opportunity to respond. At that point, we will all roll our eyes together and then simply move on, okay? And on our panel today, we have Ken Ray, Leslie Moorhead, and Angela Wyckoff. Keeping time today at our debate is Greg Wallinger. It's his first time and my first time, so I'm sure things are gonna go very smoothly. <laughs> Not. At the conclusion of the questions, the debaters will make their two-minute closing statements. Charlie Hales will close the debate. Please be respectful of the debaters and please hold all applause until the end of the program. To quote Stephen Colbert, I will be your voice. Now sit down and be quiet. <laughs> now a little bit about our debaters. Jefferson Smith became a nonprofit entrepreneur when he gathered friends together to start the Oregon Bus Project, a national model of hands-on democracy for the next generation. The Bus Project has developed hundreds of future leaders, registered tens of thousands of voters, and launched national activities. In 2008, he was elected to represent East Portland and the Oregon House, and then re-elected in 2010. Charlie Hales has spent the last decade working across the country at HDR Engineering. As its senior vice president, he helped to grow the employee-owned company from 2,700 employees to nearly 8,000 today. He was elected to Portland City Council in 1992 and served for 10 years, where his accomplishments include the opening of Portland's first streetcar line and passing the first parks bond measure in over 50 years. And now, if I could please invite the debaters to their podiums. You can clap now. This is a good time. <laughs> 
All right, gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. And Mr. Smith, you have the opening statement first, and you have three minutes. Whenever you're ready. Hello. I'm Jefferson Smith, and I'm running for mayor because this is my hometown, and we can make it work better for more people. As a legislator, I've worked for higher performing schools, homegrown jobs, a more transparent government. I've built teams and led a successful nonprofit organization. I've lived a flawed life, and I've led. While states around the country push to restrict voter access, I work to expand it with online voter registration, better enforcement of the National Voter Registration Act, leading the bus project that has now registered 80,000 voters in Oregon alone. While much of the economic policy chatter fixated on tax breaks, my team worked on innovating and investing in a homegrown economy. When power pushed a highway mega bridge to Clark County, I pushed back. I had the chance to share in others' leadership when I carried a bill to trim middle management and prioritize frontline services. Before it became the stuff of national news, we worked to reform laws around human trafficking to help women and girls trapped in modern-day slavery. Sometimes leadership is going with the tide or reflecting the context. Often real leadership is working to shift that tide, to shape the context. As mayor, I'll focus on three things, getting Portland working by focusing on helping local business, more cost-conscious infrastructure, workforce development, and accelerating early-stage business growth, not just economic hunting, but economic gardening. Working better, saving money on management costs, modernizing government in a cost-conscious way, a 311 system for all non-emergency government phone calls, and working for more people. This is what got me in the race. Where Katie and I live, people experience Portland very differently. In the 90s, the city pushed infill housing into East Portland, complete with a nice community center, but without needed investments in streets, parks, or schools. We must see the whole city. And we'll prioritize education and do our part around summers and early education, work readiness, getting the city working better for more people. I also want to say thanks. Thanks for having us. Thanks for being the City Club. At forums and interviews for the past years, past year and three weeks, I've been asked in front of groups, large and small, what will you do for the Pearl District, for the Police Association, for Lewis and Clark University? The City Club asked the question, what will you do for the city? I welcome that question. Thank you, Mr. Hales, your opening statement. Thank you very much. I'm Charlie Hales, and I'm running for mayor of Portland for one big reason, because I love this city. And I know, although Portland is a great place, that we've seen some drift lately, some loss of focus, a scattered agenda in City Hall where we've fallen short on some basics. And I thought to myself, I can help fix that. There's some real challenges. We need a steady hand at the wheel to meet them. We need leadership, which I define as courage and clarity and the ability to use those things to get things done. You need all of those traits to be an effective mayor. Those are qualifications that I have and qualities that I've demonstrated. I'll bring to this office 10 years in business experience, and that'll come in handy as we reconsider water rates and rebuild our economy. I'll bring a 10-year record of accomplishment in city government, where we diversified the fire bureau, and in transportation, paved more streets, but gave people more choices, like Max to the airport. In our Parks Bureau, where we took a great old legacy system and made it fresh and new again, and built, yes, those new community centers where there's all that life and love and family every day of the week. My bureaus were better for my leadership, and so was the whole city. We brought people together, even those who disagreed, and got the good things done. I've demonstrated my love for Portland, not just in politics, but with my own two hands as a volunteer in nonprofits, like so many of you in this room. 
In one of them, in Friends of Trees, I've been working for the last 20 years to help plant 420,000 trees across this city and this region. We're the only major city in the country where the tree canopy is increasing. My favorite of those trees are on my neighborhood Main Street, Milwaukee Avenue. We planted them, my sons and I, as saplings, and now they're Chanticleer pears this big around and 40 feet tall, and they're beautiful. My wife, Nancy, teases me that I should run for this office on a tool belt because I like to fix stuff. That's why I'm here. That's a skill set that's needed in city government right now. The skills to bring people together, find solutions, and make them real. We must have those skills because there's some things we need to change. Our schools need to get out of the permanent emergency and have certainty of funding. Our police bureau needs to practice de-escalation and be a partner in the community. We need more and better jobs to rethink and right-size the Portland Development Commission. People might look at the two candidates for mayor and say, those are two progressive guys. What's the difference? The difference is there's only one of us with any city or business experience, only one with a proven track record of actually getting it done in Portland, only one of us with the skills, experience, and focus to take those progressive values and turn them into real improvements in the life of our city and for the lives of Portlanders. I have those skills and that passion for this place. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you both. We will now move to the portion of the program where I will ask the questions that have been prepared by the Friday Forum Committee and the City Club staff. There are up to four different kinds of questions. <laughs> okay, everybody in the audience, there will be a quiz. Please take notes. I will direct questions to both debaters, each of whom will have 60 seconds to respond. I will also ask each debater a question, and then the other debater will not have a chance to respond at all. I will direct some questions to one debater. He will have 60 seconds to respond, and then the other debater will have 45 seconds to rebut. We've made this as difficult Got it. as humanly possible. It's going to be great. Okay, good. Finally, my favorite part, we will move to the lightning round where I will pose a series of questions which the candidates must answer yes, no, or waffle. But they will only hold up cards to show their response and I will read their response out loud because it would be cruel to ask you to only have a one word answer, right? They will not be given a chance to explain their answers. We do encourage you to use your time not only to offer your response, but to rebut their opponent's statement. And don't worry, I will tell you how much time you have each time I ask you a question, because even I could not remember that. <laughs> so we will begin with questions to both Mr. Smith and Mr. Hales, and you will both have 60 seconds to answer these questions. Mr. Hales will answer the first question first. When making a policy decision, you may get input from many different sources, city government staff, other commissioners, the public, the media, and jurisdictions looking at the same issue. So how do you process all of this information and come to the best decision? This is one of those cases where you don't have to wonder if what I say in my answer will be demonstrated in my actions, because I did serve you once before. And I think it's very important, Tracy, to take in all of that input, to have a, a deliberation in our city that really does listen, that really does reach out, as we did in those battles over the community centers. There were some people that were really upset about that. We tried to bring everyone to the table and really listen to even those that vehemently disagreed with what was being proposed. And that's a responsibility of leadership, to really listen. And then you do have to decide and not get mired in process. So that's an art, and it's hard to describe that art, but I think I practiced it in all those decisions I made. I also went to the trouble as an elected official, and I'll do this again, to reach out to the jurisdictions other than the city of Portland. We're not an island, we're in a region, we're in a state. And those relationships that I built with everyone from the mayor of Pendleton to the mayor of Enterprise, who sat next to me when we opened West Side Light Rail, are important as well as listening here in town. Mr. Smith, you have 60 seconds. Priorities, values, and people, and trying to be clear with each. 
Priorities we have set in a general way, getting the city working better for more people. We'll set measurable objectives within each that will be clear across city government and hopefully across partners. Second, values. We have four critical policy values, prosperity, equity, sustainability, democracy, making those values clear across your own team and across partners. The other is people. Starting even now and clarified during the transition period immediately after the election, we will build a set of transition teams, each around topic areas. They will include supporters of people who were also running for mayor. They will include people who aren't of my own political power and my own political party, excuse me. We will listen based on facts. They will make recommendations, yes, for policy positions, as well as for staffers also serving as ongoing advisors. Hopefully by clarifying our people, yes, but also our values and priorities from the beginning, we can have an ecosystem that understands itself. This next question is also for both of you. Mr. Smith, you'll go first. There has been lots of commentary about questionable choices you have each made in your personal and professional lives. When you look at the personal qualities executive skills and experience demanded of the mayor's job, what do you bring to the position? 60 seconds. So, since I was in first grade, there's some things I've done worse than most of my classmates. Uh, I would not hire myself to be in charge of the, filling out the water bill. There's some other things I do very well. I process information better than most people I know. I work harder than just about anybody I know. I listen surprisingly well. I can synthesize and clarify a vision and articulate it in a consistent way and stick to values. I care more than just about anybody I know. When I was in first grade, I thought I was the dumbest kid in my class. I couldn't finish my work. And I went from being that kid to never fundamentally changing, never being perfect, but to graduating to the top of my class from Harvard Law School to clerking for a federal judge, to starting and running a successful nonprofit, to serving and showing leadership in the Oregon legislature, to putting together one of the strongest grassroots campaigns in the history of this city. I think I have some traits our city needs right now. Mr. Hales. I've made some mistakes in my life and even in this campaign, and it's really important when you do to own up to them, to take them as your own, to apologize and to move on and to make sure that they don't happen again. And then you get criticized, of course, in public life, even for things that aren't mistakes. In this campaign, I've been criticized for moving to Washington, and it's one of the best things I ever did, because I met my wife, Nancy, and made a commitment to her to move into her home in Stevenson, not Camas, as I've been called, um, Stevenson, Washington, to help her raise our kids and then move back to my hometown of Portland. That was no mistake. It was a commitment to our family, and I'm glad we made it. What do I bring to this office? Again, I think the most important quality in a mayor, in any community leader, is that trait of leadership, and I really do believe it's those things. It's courage, the willingness to take on the status quo, as I did with the Fire Bureau. It's clarity, to speak plainly when someone asks you a question. And it's the ability to turn those ideals into real things and make people's lives better. This next question is just for Mr. Hales. Mr. Hales, you've spent the last several years in the private sector working on mass transportation issues. Portland, of course, has a rich variety of mass transportation options. Is Portland where the city needs to be with mass transit, or is there more that needs to be done? You have 60 seconds. Wow. No. <laughs> Portland Go is, ahead, a little more. Portland is not where it needs to be, though we should be pr very proud of what we've done. We are a better place to live with more choices. We burn a billion dollars less in gasoline than our numerical equivalents do in the rest of the world. A lot of people in this room have worked very hard to make this great agenda of transit and smart growth and urban growth boundaries all actually work. So we should be proud of what we've done. And what we've built so far is making a huge difference. But now we have new challenges. TriMet is in a, in a time of difficulty. We have to help them be able to provide good transit service to every neighborhood, get people to work, get our kids to school, 
all of our kids, not just the ones in Portland Public School District number one. So there's a lot of work to do to make sure that we can actually operate the transit system that we've built, and then when we've done that, we sh we're not done building a great transit system. There's more to build, but first good management, and then some more rails. Mr. Smith, this question is only for you. Having recently served as a state legislator, what are the priorities for the city of Portland during the 2013 legislative session, and how would you be involved in pursuit of those priorities? You have 60 seconds. Budget, education, transportation, and then making sure we listen to the remainder of the city council and particularly the people of Portland to shape a city agenda. I am not running for mayor to champion our legislative agenda. I am running for mayor to hear from Portlanders about what our legislative agenda ought to be. There are a few things that I think will be high on that list. We've got to balance the budget. This is not the 1990s when we are unloading truckloads of federal money and when we are passing Measure 5 thinking it will never impact the bottom line eventually. The only budgets I have ever known are cut budgets. It reflects why we've tried to be careful with our own money and was the only candidate without any debt coming out of the primary. It also is why we need to prioritize education in our lobbying efforts. We have transportation needs in our city that aren't met. Those are three. We'll also have to address equity, a host of other issues, the CRC, but a lot of that is going to be not about me imposing, but about me listening. Now I will direct a question to one debater who will get 60 seconds, and then the second debater will have 45 seconds for a rebuttal. The first question goes to Mr. Hales. Public employees are facing a 45% hike in PERS costs, and public employee health care costs continue to rise as well. How will you address spiraling costs for PERS and health care? 60 seconds. This is a major problem, not just for the city of Portland, but for 900 state and local government entities around the state. Um, and I want to support Governor Kitzhaber and Treasurer Wheeler in their leadership on this. They are taking on this difficult issue. We have to both keep the bargain that we've made with our employees, but put this system on a sustainable path. So I support that objective. I think some of the things that the City Club pointed out in this report, like using the risk-free risk, rate, risk -free rate of return, uh, like dealing with the, uh, the out-of-state residents that are getting a bump that isn't actually earned. There's some things like that that we can do in the system that don't break the bargain with our employees, but start to have millions and millions of dollars worth of downstream benefits. So we have to start with those smart and common sense management changes that the Governor and the Treasurer are proposing, and I'll be there to help them as I did when I was the League of Cities president. Again, this is not a new phenomenon for me, state and local cooperation. Mr. Smith, your rebuttal, 45 seconds. First, I will not join the anti-government clarion call or the attack on public workers that has not resolved our budget, but that has led to greater dissatisfaction with public structures, that has contributed to the most gaping wealth disparity since before World War II. I will be a fiduciary. I will work to balance the budget. I will be on the other side of a bargaining table recognizing my duty is not to any public worker, but to everybody in the city. I will support the current FPD and R reforms. I will support seeing if there is something we can do with out-of-state retirees. I will see to it that we abide by the Constitution. But when we talk about this, and I want to say this to the City Club, let's do it with public structures in mind in a positive way, not just by trying to tear them down. Our next question, Mr. Smith, you'll begin on this one. Oops, okay. We have two, so you have 30 seconds to uh, try to answer that question well, again. And the question, just the very small part of it, how will you address spiraling costs for PERS and health care? 30 seconds. I mentioned what I would do about PERS. I didn't mention health care. I did support the governor's health care reforms at the state level. I'll continue to do that as a voice in the city. There might be a couple of things that a mayor can do to convene partners to try to drive down costs and use more joint purchasing power. There are a few tools that San Francisco has used to try to increase access and lower costs. We're exploring a few of those. Thank you. Okay, the next question begins with you, Mr. Smith. In a report entitled, 
is Portland really where young people go to retire? <laughs> the authors point to something they call the amenity paradox, and that's the notion that everything we have, the great amenities here, draw people to the region, but then the resulting growth can erode the very quality of life that attracted them. So as mayor, how would you address Portland's amenity paradox? You have 60 seconds. I would call it hogwash. It's hogwash. <laughs> Attracting smart people who don't yet have a job is not a detriment to the city. It is a benefit to the city. If you want to predict city success throughout history, not just our city, bet on human capital. When you get more of it, you do better. Maybe not in the first year, but certainly after 10. Right now, some of that is a lagging indicator from conversations that were happening years ago, and even when the TV show Portlandia was started. But now we know that we're fourth in entrepreneurship, fifth in small business starts, seventh in patents, and recently ranked 11th in best places to start and grow an early stage business. We want people to come here who are smart and like how we are. That is also should inform our immigration policy. This is a country that got stronger because people came here, not in spite of it. And I will work to do everything we can to draw people who want to be here because of the place we are. Mr. Hales, your rebuttal and response. You have 45 seconds. I think Jason Djurjevich and his colleagues did a good job on that study. And I don't think it's hogwash. I think it's actually an, a wake-up call for us. Uh, we have a couple of these young people living in our home, so I can represent that statement. Um, and we want them to move out. No, it's fine, Carolyn, you can stay. Um, so that to me is an indicator that they, we're, we have some time to make Portland a place where they can build a life. They didn't come here to retire. The report clearly documents that. But we need to provide them opportunity. So that's why I propose things like Community Credit Portland, making access to credit for small and growing businesses easier. Things like expanding the seed fund so that the city can help startups start up and keep going. I think there are things we can do to help them be entrepreneurs, stay here, and build the future. The next question goes to Mr. Hales first. Portland has an extremely low vacancy rate for rental housing, and rents in Portland relative to the average income are reportedly some of the highest in the nation. As mayor, what will you do to ensure that lower income residents aren't priced out of housing? You have 60 seconds. Commissioner Fish is here, and he and his staff and his bureau work hard on this issue, and we know how difficult it is for the city and the county and others that working on these issues to make sure there's enough affordable housing. There's some things we can do. First of all, we can use more development agreements like the one we used in the Pearl District to assure that over 25 percent of that housing in that redevelopment district was, uh, was affordable. We don't have to have a mandate from the state for inclusionary zoning for the city of Portland to be able to do the right thing, and we did it in that case. Uh, secondly, we have very high fees in the city of Portland for new development, fifteen or $20,000 per unit in new apartments. And that's a downdraft on the ability of the private sector to build housing at all, much less affordable housing. And we have a difference about this issue. I think we need to reconsider the price of our system's development charges and see if we aren't pricing ourselves out of the future. So this is an issue that I want the city to review and, in fact, is scheduled to be considered by the city council early next year. Mr. Smith, you have 45 seconds. We need to, we need to preserve the 30 percent set aside. We need to explore regional funding solutions. We need to make sure that no net loss of housing agreements are abided by within the neighborhood so that we do less displacement than we've done over the last 20 years. One of the differences in this race is I do think that it was a mistake when the Home Builders Association passed a statewide ban on inclusionary zoning. One of the best tools that almost every other city has for affordable housing is not only offering money in getting some additional affordable housing built, but making it required for new developments. We should have that tool. It's a difference in the race. I hope we'll have a chance to explore it. Three, two, thank you. <laughs> we'll take a breath, because this next question goes to you as All well. Right. The current city council has committed Portland to pursue policies that will lead to 25% of all the trips within the city to be made by bicycle and 25% by public transportation by the year 2030. Is this a realistic goal? 
and what will you do in the next four years to advance it, especially in light of tight budgets that have curtailed mass transit and may actually pit bicyclists against motorists in the quest for infrastructure improvements? 60 seconds. I hope it's realistic. If we're going to grow 5,000 to 6,000 people a year, we just don't have room for 5,000 to 6,000 cars a year. So we've got to figure out ways for people to move around the city that include cars but aren't limited to it. The other is I want to reframe the question a little bit and say that I hope we won't frame the debate consistently as we have too often as bicycles versus cars. That the way I look at the future tea leaves, I see an aging community, I see retirees, we have more baby boomers retiring, not using primarily even cars or bikes. We need an age-friendly transportation system that works whether you're 8 or you're 80. Some ways we can do that. First, we need to plan our city for fewer shorter trips. Where I live, a lot fewer people ride a bicycle, in part because you've got to go a lot farther. So we've got to plan our city with that in mind. We've made some mistakes in that regard. Second, we've got to look at a broad-based transportation package. Third, we've got to be cost-conscious with streetcars, CRCs, etc. Mr. Hales, you have 45 seconds to respond. Of course it's not realistic. It's ambitious, and it's wonderful. And that's why we are Portland, and we are that national model. So remember where we were a few years ago. And I want to give a shout out to the people that have continued this work after I helped start it. When I left office, there were 16, I'm sorry, there were 4,000 bike commuters a day coming to downtown Portland. Now there's 16,000. That's not realistic. So we need to keep being unrealistic in that way. Now, we need to be good stewards of the transportation system that we have and put more money into basic maintenance, pave the streets, and show people that we're managing their money well and that we're not spending it all on bike lanes but we need to keep building that city of the future, even while we repair the cracks in the pavement of the city that we have. The next question will go to you first, Mr. Hales. The U.S. Department of Justice has criticized Portland police for perpetuating a culture of unnecessary violence, particularly with respect to the mentally ill. How will you ensure that this culture changes? You have 60 seconds. The need for that change and the need for us to move decisively towards a model of community policing is one of the main reasons that I decided to run for this office, along with education and the economy and the need to get quality of life in all of our neighborhoods. This issue, and the Department of Justice has reminded us how critical it is, is a public tragedy for our city and it's a responsibility for me, I hope, as your next police commissioner to turn us clearly in that direction. What does community policing look like? It looks like a ride-along I did with Officer Madison Caesar, where he cruised past his neighborhood park. He lived there. He grew up there. With the windows rolled down, calling out to the young people in that park by name, saying, James, I don't want to see you here again at 8 o'clock when I come by again. That model of engagement, of crime prevention, of understanding the community that we police must be the way we proceed. And then we need to change the rules for who we hire, how we train them, and what the rules are for the use of force. Mr. Smith, you have 45 seconds for your response. I know deeply that we need to amplify the problem-solving culture within the Bureau. Let's say a little bit about how we need to do that. We need an honest-to-goodness mobile health, mobile mental health crisis unit that right now is neither mobile nor a crisis unit. We need an honest-to-goodness mental health crisis triage center that somebody can go while experiencing a psychotic episode rather than waiting for it to subside. We need to make sure we back a chief who is committed to the kind of values that our community expects. We need to make sure shift sergeants are amplifying those same values. We need to use the opportunity of a new training center to change and improve training practices. We need to make sure that we work with community to bridge the divisions between our police and our community. And ultimately, we have to make this a priority to live up to the Department of Justice findings and recommendations, not only in letter, but in spirit. This question goes to Mr. Smith first. The Urban League of Portland recently issued a racial equity strategy guide that recommended establishing strong leadership and support for a citywide racial equity initiative with measurable targets and outcomes. What do you think is the most important racial justice issue facing our community? 
And what will you do as mayor to ensure a racial justice lens is applied to your work and the policies that you promote? 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Mm, big question. 60 seconds for a challenge that our city hasn't embraced in our history in nearly meaningful way, as we should have. We covered just one of them just now, making sure that we have a police bureau that reflects our community, diversifying that bureau from command staff to entry-level staff. But since we've talked about that, let me also talk about education. Some of that is about funding. Some of it is also about the school year. More and more information is showing the biggest driver in achievement gaps, and not only between upper-income students and lower-income students, or students of color and white students, but also between domestic students and students in India and China, is the summer gap. What happens for kids who don't have a ticket to equestrian camp, who didn't have a ticket here today, and they fall further and further behind every summer and become slightly more likely to end up like the 13-year-old kid beaten and shot to death 10 blocks away from my house during this election. We've got to close the summer gap. We've got to make sure that education is equitable. To do that, we've also got to make sure I diversify my staff and will, and have talked about it from the beginning of this campaign, and equity is a huge part of why I got in the race. Mr. Hales, you only have 45 seconds for this question. I think the number one racial inequity in our city is the achievement gap among our children. There are others. The city is not a model employer, and I'll get back to that. Um, the city itself can apply, and we will, an equity lens to everything we do, and do that in concert with the county and others who are trying to do the same things. Uh, although I was initially skeptical about the Office of Equity, I will assign that office to myself because it needs to have the full clout of the mayor behind it, not because Commissioner Fritz has done a bad job. She's done an excellent job. But if it's going to translate into behavior change in the agencies, it must be by my side. Again, you don't have to wonder in my case. This is a dis distinction about whether I can turn the vision we share and the words we exchange into real things. You just have to look at the Fire Bureau, where there used to be a handful of women and people of color, and now there are 150. We're going to move on to the lightning round. The more questions you get right, the more money you win. Oh, no, wait, that's <laughs> not it. You're such a liar. <laughs> You're such a liar. It, it, I got confused. They used to have this in password, didn't they? Dating myself. Well, uh, here's how this works. Both Mr. Hales and Mr. Smith will be asked the same question. Their only response will be yes, no, or waffle. They each have the cards indicating their responses and will need to answer as soon as I'm done asking the question. No peeking over at the other guy. I will read the responses out loud, and you will not have an opportunity to expand on your answer. <laughs> We're going to run through some ballot measures. So much for that waffle. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Referrals and initiatives. These are some of the things coming up on the November ballot. And uh, we want to find out how you have decided to vote on them. Measure 79, which would ban a real estate transfer tax. Ban it? Yes. They both said no. Measure 80, which would create a cannabis commission to regulate the cultivation and sale of cannabis. Mr. Hales says yes. It's called innovation, Tracy. Jefferson Smith running for mayor. Mr. Smith held up both his yes and a waffle sign. And I will not interpret that. I will not. I will stay employed. Measure 82, which authorizes establishment of privately owned casinos. Both the candidates say no. Measure 83, which authorizes a Multnomah County casino. Both say no. Measure 84, which phases out estate and inheritance taxes. Mr. Hale says no. Mr. Smith says no. Measure 85, which allocates the corporate income tax kicker refund to additionally fund K through 12 schools. Both candidates say yes. Measure 26-143, which creates a Multnomah County Library Taxing District. Both candidates say yes. 
I don't know if there's extra points for being first, but I will check into that. <laughs> Measure 26-144, the Portland Public School District Bond Measure. Both candidates say yes. And this is our last question for the lightning round, although I really, really like this. Measure 26-146, the Portland Arts Tax. <laughs> Mr. Hale says yes, Mr. Smith says yes with a waffle. Okay, uh, we're gonna jump over to a set of questions now. This one, you will both have 60 seconds to respond to, and I want to make sure I get it in because it's really a great question. <laughs> Mr. Hales, your answer will come first. If you're elected, you might be offered a part in Portlandia. <laughs> I'll be jealous, but would you prefer to play yourself or someone else, and please describe your character. My character will be um, a bicycle uh, with a tavern attached to it. Uh, there are a couple in town, but it looks like a great gig. And um, unlike the button-down character that Mayor Adams has played, I'm going to insist on the makeup artists pulling out all the stops. <laughs> I don't want to be under-tattooed or under-pierced. <laughs> Mr. Smith. I don't intend to be on the show. Okay. Didn't use the whole time there, but... All right, now these questions will be addressed to one debater who will get 60 seconds. The second debater will have 45 seconds to rebut. This question goes to Mr. Hales. Four of the Multnomah County Commissioners are women. The City Council has just one woman. This balance is not going to change in 2013. Does this issue matter to you? And how can you be a change agent on this front? It does matter. And I want to be a change agent, as I have, uh, in trying to develop new leaders. I think that's one of the most exciting opportunities right now with all these creative young people getting involved in community life. I was actually meeting with a group of them last night. And that energy and that interest and passion for getting involved in the city is there. So no, they didn't come here to retire. They came here to get involved and ultimately lead, as I've had the chance to do. And actually, one of the things I really want to do in this tour of public service, if that's what the voters decide for me to do, is develop that next generation of leaders. I'm really pleased, actually, that we now have Aaron Janssens as our fire chief. But I was distressed in this room when Chief Reese introduced his command staff, and they were all white men. So we have work to do in reflecting our diversity of the city in the people that work for us, that lead our public agencies, and ultimately sit at that city council and county board table. Ms. Oh. I'm sorry, what will I do? Okay, you will have 30 seconds to try to answer that again, and let me just paraphrase right. the question for you to see if that helps. Does this issue matter to you? How can you be a change agent on this front? What can you do? Yes, okay, yes, it does matter. Yes, I have been a change agent, as I mentioned, with the Fire Bureau because I made that ideal real in who we hired, we'll do the same thing in the bureaus that I lead. That diversity of gender and ethnicity will be reflected in my own staff. Uh, and I'll help with leadership development efforts around the city, like Emerge, that's working to train the next generation of women who want to run for office. Mr. Smith, you have 45 seconds. Yes, it's a priority. Yes, I will hope to build upon and improve my own record on the issue. I'm proud that my successor at the bus project is Caitlin Baggett, a genius. I am proud that my successor in my own legislative race is Jessica Peterson, the first Latina in the Oregon House. I am proud that the political program that we started to develop political leaders is spawning all sorts of marvelously talented people, at least half women, I believe in every class, at le and, or at least in the entirety of classes. We also need to look forward that in my own staff will reflect those values, that I will do not only starting to go to emerge, but also having already been a trainer, I think, in their very first class, attending yesterday New Leadership Portland's lunch, 
that I hope not only by my own decisions but my own influence we'll be able to demonstrate equity and also include people of color in our leadership development conversations. This next question will begin with you, Mr. Smith. Do you think Portland has a good working relationship with its neighbors, both cities and counties? If not, how would you repair them? Please provide a few examples of issues you plan to work on with neighboring cities and counties during your term as mayor. You have 60 seconds. I'm not sure how to characterize the existing relationships. I think they could be stronger. There are a lot of things changing. Unlike 20 years ago, Portland is no longer the majority of the region. We now have to be humble, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it's mathematically necessary. We need to make sure to build on those relationships. One of the first sets of meetings I did was with a series of leaders and elected leaders in regional governments around Portland. So I could say this, I don't need you now. There's nothing you can do to help me win, essentially. But I will need you if I'm elected, and we'll need each other. And I want you to remember this conversation so we can start building relationships. We'll also need to look for more win-win solutions. One of the reasons I think the Columbia River crossing is such an enormous historical mistake is that its impacts will not only be felt by increased asthma down in inner north and northeast Portland, but also by Washington County trying to recruit businesses versus Vancouver that we've got to look for education opportunities. We've got to look for economic development strategies within our cluster strategy, and there's more. Mr. Hales, you have 45 seconds. I think that relationship, honestly, at the moment is a bit strained, and it needs some improvement. Uh, I understand that although um, I certainly applaud the Council's decision to fluoridate our water, I understand that the wholesale water customers, the Tualatin Valley Water District and other districts that buy water from the city of Portland, found out about that impending decision by reading about it in the newspaper. That's not good intergovernmental relations. And again, you don't have to wonder about me on this issue. I went to the trouble to become the League of Oregon Cities president. Lord knows, not because I needed any more meetings to go to, but because those relationships matter. The ability to work in tandem on urban growth, on transportation, on water, on equity, on housing, on homelessness. There are a whole list of issues that we need those good relationships around the region in order to make progress together. Gentlemen, this will probably be our last question before we go to uh, closing statements. And Mr. Smith, you will answer first on this. You were just talking a bit about it, but in September, a Willamette Week headline stated that the two of you are not so different when it comes to your positions on the Columbia River crossing. Where do you differ, and why will you be most successful working with all of the stakeholders on the CRC issue? 60 seconds. So that was one of the significant journalistic mistakes the Willamette Week has made this year. Uh, the, in one of the first debates in this election, we were asked about the CRC. One candidate said he'd get the project started in the first year of his administration. I said otherwise. In order to do that, you have to cleave pretty closely to the current studies and the current plan already being done. You can call it something different. You can say you want to move the Hayden Island interchange or make it smaller or eliminate it. You can say you want to change the height. But if what you're essentially talking about is a single main span, a bunch of interchanges and light rail, that's the CRC. We can't pay for it. It's not a good idea for our community. It might be the end of me politically, but we should and this club should be doing something about it. I am the better person to work on this issue because I've been willing to embrace the facts from the beginning. I haven't waited for the political context to catch up with me. When I came out against this issue, both the polls and most of the political power in this state and this region were heck-bent on this project, and I resisted it. I will make sure we have a solution that follows the facts. Mr. Hales, you also have 60 oh, seconds on this they issue. They have questions, oh. and I'm happy oh, okay. to talk longer. All right. <laughs> Okay, so uh, here we go. Where do you differ and why will you be most successful working with all of the stakeholders on the CRC issue? I'll say a seconds. little more about each. Where we differ is that I don't support a slightly trimmed down version of the current plan. I think a much better plan would be something like the Common Sense Alternative, which you can use google.com, it's a website to search. How I would be better situated to work on that is that hopefully the people of the region will be able to trust that I've been looking at the facts from the beginning. 
and if and when we actually do something, it will be based on those facts and not be based on trying to reflect the context. Okay, now Mr. Hales, you have 60 seconds. I said the same thing about this project from when Willamette Week first interviewed me about it in June of last year, which is that I don't support the current version of the project, but I believe there is a version in there somewhere, like the pony in the old joke, that we can get to and that fits our values and that we can move out of endless planning and into construction. We've spent $150 million planning this project. You can look at another $150 million and see the difference between us on this issue. It's not the words we use. It's not the hope for a better project. It's that I can turn discord into progress. I woke up one morning and saw that the port was going to have a whole bunch of parking garages and no transit. I called together the partners along with Mayor Katz, and we spent $150 million and built light rail to the airport 10 years ahead of schedule. That's what I bring to this issue, not an ideology, but an ability to bring people together and to get to yes. All right, let me rephrase that. <laughs> let me try one more time here. Um, what did I they miss? would like to know a little bit more. The specifics of the question are where do you differ from your opponent, and why will you be most successful working with all of the stakeholders on the CRC issue? Well, I, I think I answered the latter part, but I'll try both again. I think we differ uh, not that much in the project that we have in mind, which is not 17 lanes across Hayden Island, not trying to use an interstate highway for every trip in that corridor. Yes, light rail to Clark County. Yes, a better pedestrian and bicycle connection than the vestigial one that's out there now. Ever try to ride it? The difference between us is that I know how to bring transportation projects and complex intergovernmental agreements to fruition. Okay, now we're going to go to closing statements. This is the final portion of the program. You each have two minutes for closing statements, and we will begin with Jefferson Smith. Thanks for having me. In the lightning round, we were asked a set of questions about statewide ballot measures. And on statewide ballot measures, we have a lot of agreement. But for the critical issues, and many of the most critical issues facing our city, there is meaningful disagreement. I don't doubt Charlie's commitment or his ability to bring the Columbia River crossing to fruition. It is one of the reasons I think I should be the mayor. I have not promised that we should either eliminate or temporarily eliminate or significantly reduce the fees developers are supposed to pay on water, parks, sewers, and streets. Because my governmental experience has faced cut budgets, and my life experience, and longer than that, my wife's, has seen what happens to neighborhoods when you push in a bunch of infill housing without investing in those basics. That on the Office of Equity, I didn't need to wait for a staffer to be identified or for the electorate to become more liberal to say that I recognize that our city is changing and it isn't getting whiter. And that didn't start in June. That started before I ran for my very first office. That we agree on a lot of things, but in reflecting the values of this city and in thinking about how we need to be thinking about the future, there are meaningful differences in this race. We are at a defining moment in our city. Portlanders are out of work, students falling through cracks, people feeling disconnected from power. As mayor, I'll focus on three things, getting the city working better for more people. To do any of this, I'll need your help. What has made our city strong is not that we select the right succession of smart liberals, or that we have the deepest port or the most famous universities or the sunniest weather but because we have the best human beings, that we need to think not only about the hardware of our city, but the software of our city. To be the mayor, I will readily admit I need you. Thanks very much. And Mr. Hales, you have two minutes. Well, thank you, City Club, Tracy, Jeff, for a great discussion. Let me tell you what I want to see in Portland in four years, if I have the privilege of serving you as Portland's next mayor. We'll be proud of our city, and we'll be proud of our city government. We'll be making significant progress in the following areas. All of our children will be getting a good education in great public schools. 
our local economy will be growing because we've harnessed that new talent and a lot of hardworking people to create more good-paying jobs and make Portland prosperous for all. We'll have an increased trust between our police and our citizens, working in partnership to get illegal guns off the street and to de-escalate conflicts before they become tragedies. Our city workforce will better reflect the wonderful diversity that our city now enjoys. We'll be cleaning up the Superfund site in the Willamette River. Gateway Green and other parks will be complete and beautiful and full of families. We'll be paving streets and sidewalks in neighborhoods that need them those 60 miles of unpaved streets, because we'll be focusing on basic services. We'll have a transit system that serves all of us that we can afford, and I'll have a pet project. We're going to pull all the ivy with thousands of volunteers out of Forest Park. <laughs> the nuts and bolts of running a city may not be exciting to some people in politics, but they are to me. This is a serious job that requires some particular qualities somebody with experience in management who can focus, who can work well with others, and who can lead as a member of a team in our peculiar form of government, not just with flowery words, but an ability to get things done. Someone who loves cities, and I'm that guy. Yesterday, I was at a women's leadership celebration, and a young woman spoke about her hopes for Portland. She said she wants Portland to remain ex an extraordinary place where extraordinary people do extraordinary things. I can't wait to get started, to serve as Portland's next mayor and to help make her hopes real. I believe Portland's best days are ahead, and I ask for your vote. Thank you very much. Thanks to both of you gentlemen. Give them some applause. I want to thank our Truth Squad members, Ken Ray, Leslie Moorhead, and Angela Wyckoff. Thank you to our timekeeper, Greg Wallinger, and a special thank you to our moderator, Tracy Berry. And of course, our greatest appreciation to our debaters, Charlie Hales and Jefferson Smith. Please join us again next week to hear how the economy will determine the 2012 elections. We are adjourned.